Okay, so in this video we're going to take a look at the unique properties of water. And water, it's absolutely necessary for life. Uh, most living organisms go from anywhere from about 50% water up to 95% per, water. So that will be things like jellyfish and other invertebrate animals that really are obviously mostly water when you dehydrate them. So the first big thing about water is that it's a polar molecule. And what we mean by a polar molecule is a little bit different than what we mean by the fact when we talk about a polar bond. What we mean with a polar molecule is that it's got charged ends and charged parts. So we're not really talking about the bond so much, although that plays a role, because if you're a polar molecule, you have to have at least one polar covalent bond. There are polar and nonpolar molecules. Polar molecules have an uneven charge distribution where polar well nonpolar molecules have an even charge distribution. And one of the reasons water's polar, of course, is because we've got these non-bonding electrons up here that will give the water molecule uh, a negative dipole up at the top of those non-bonding electrons in the oxygen. And then if we remember this bond between the hydrogens and oxygens, it has an electronegativity difference of 1.4. Okay, And that 1.4 means that the electrons spend much more time around the oxygen atom from the hydrogen than they do around the hydrogen atom. So that means that we're going to have a positive charge here on each hydrogen. So when we look at a water molecule, it ends up that we end up having a situation where we've got an unequal distribution of charges. There's no symmetry. There's no place we can sort of divide this molecule where it looks exactly the same. Now we're going to take a look at a different molecule. The molecule is going to be fluorine tribromide. Sorry, not bromine trifluoride, but boron trifluoride. Now boron trifluoride is Another molecule, it's got different electronegativity differences, but what we end up with with boron trifluoride is we still have our negative dipoles around the fluoride atoms around the outside, but we've got an equal distribution of charges, so we don't have to worry about uh, having charged ends like we typically worry about with water. Another example of this is carbon tetrachloride. Now carbon tetrachloride is a different molecule or difference in electronegativity between the carbon and the chlorine ends up being 0.5 write that in there, 0.5 and so that means our electrons spend more time, we're still polar so we're going to have negative dipoles around these chlorine atoms but because again we've got a symmetrical distribution of charge where the whole outside of this molecule is negative this molecule is still nonpolar because it's got a symmetrical distribution of charge. So that's the main difference between these two molecules is the fact that we've got asymmetrical distribution with water up here Okay, so anything with the uh, asymmetrical distribution of charges is going to be polar. Anything with a symmetrical distribution of charges is, of course, now going to be non. So anything with that symmetrical distribution of charges will be polar. Now, there's a lot of other tricks and tips for figuring out the difference between polar and nonpolar molecules, but just in general, it comes down to the symmetry of the distribution of charges. So if you've got a molecule that's all made up of nonpolar covalent bonds, for example, you don't have to worry about the charges, so it's automatically nonpolar. In general, any carbon-hydrogen bond, the hydrocarbons, tend to be pretty nonpolar. Anytime you've got oxygens and nitrogens involved, you tend to see polar molecules. 
And as we've talked about before, the hydrogen bonds and the polar molecules, the polarity, the fact that you've got a hydrogen and lone pairs of electrons, these hydrogen bonds that it can occur between water, water molecules and other molecules also give it all sorts of neat properties that you'll see when it comes time to deal with water. And it really drives things that you have to do with water, such as the cohesion where water sticks together. So this is the sticking together of water, the fact that water is sticky, and then the adhesion of water is water sticking to other substances. And if we take a look at these two test tubes here, we've got a test tube with that just dyed water in it here. And that's, you can see that, oh, we moved our whole slide there, sorry about that. And you can see that we've got um, the meniscus effect where the water is sticking together, but it's also sticking to the sides of the test tube, the glass. So that's an example of cohesion, where the water is sticking together to go up the sides, and adhesion as well, where the water is sticking to the glass. This is mercury over here, something you guys don't get to see or play with anymore. But you can see that the mercury shows cohesion, where it's sticking together. But the mercury isn't sticking to the sides of the test tube at all, so it has no adhesion type properties. Now both these two together give you surface tension. This is the idea that you can take a paper clip and you can sort of float it on the surface of water and it won't go through. And you can only do that with water and water type substances. The moment you add a little bit of detergent, you break the surface tension, you break the cohesive and adhesive properties because you mess with the hydrogen bonds and you destroy the surface tension and properties of water. Now water is less dense as a solid. It has to do with hydrogen bonds. Water makes most of its hydrogen bonds when it is it's most dense as a liquid at about four degrees Celsius. So this means this is when it's, its hydrogen bonds are the most stable and the most set. When you go below that, it starts to become less dense because there's less hydrogen bonds being formed, and that means it occupies more space. When you go above four degrees Celsius, again, you're warming up, so the molecules are moving faster. But the fact that ice is less dense than water means, of course, that it floats. And this means that when you look at a pond or something in the winter, you get that layer of ice on top, and it actually forms an insulating layer so that it actually prevents the water underneath from freezing. If this didn't happen, you'd of course see the ice sinking as it formed. That would crush most life below it and cause an overflowing of the banks. And it would probably mean that every spring, summer, you'd have to totally repopulate all the lakes and rivers. Okay. Water is an excellent solvent because it's polar. Um, it will dissolve lots of polar type substances. The solute dissolves in the solvent. The solvent's usually the liquid. Okay. Talk about the fact that like dissolves like. Okay, so the idea that polar substances dissolve in polar solutes and nonpolar solvents dissolve in nonpolar solutes. So this is that idea that you, you need to use water to get out water type based molecules. Now, if you have a, something that's nonpolar like a stain, you need a nonpolar solvent to get rid of it. In most cases, that's soap, but if it's a real serious stain, you're going to want to use this friend over here. This is our good friend we talked about with polarity of molecules, carbon tetrachloride. And this is a really nasty substance for lots of different reasons, but it's also used commonly in dry cleaning because in dry cleaning, it's not that the substances never really get wet. It's dry because you don't use water-based solvents. You use nonpolar solvents to pull out all those other types of nonpolar molecules. Now your nonpolar substances are usually fat or lipid based and so you need these nonpolar solvents to get anything out that's of a greasy or fatty, waxy type of nature. Now always remember ionic compounds they dissolve a little bit into small their small molecules but when you put them in water they fall apart. They break apart and you can see that here with this salt crystals and you get the sodium and chlorine atoms ions dissolved in water which gives you the concept of electrolytes which is important for creating electricity, sending signals in the nervous system and balancing out charges of different substances in water. Even though we talk about water as a molecule as H2O, it often isn't found as H2O depending on how you look at it because that bond between hydrogen and oxygen is so polar at 1.7 it's almost ionic so sometimes in certain circumstances the water molecule, the oxygen, may actually lose one of these hydrogens and it'll pop off 
and now you've got a hydroxide ion, we'll use OH for that, and you can also form a hydronium ion, which is H3O. But we can also talk about those hydrogen ions, those protons, okay, being lost in solution too. And there's lots of different ways of talking about acids and bases, which this dissociation, the breakdown of water, leads us to the concept of the pH scale in acids and bases. Acids are compounds that have a lot of hydrogen ions in them. And bases are compounds that have less hydrogen ions in them or more hydronium ions. It's just a different way of looking at it. It's six of one and a half dozen of the other. You just use the two different terms to suit your needs. And that's something you'll study a lot more in your chemistry courses. And of course at pH of seven you got an equal balance between the hydronium ions or the protons and the hydroxide ions at OH. So that ends up our, our characteristics of water and we'll give you lots of examples of those in class and how they make a big difference in biological systems.